Welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome once again to the Sports Pro Podcast. My name is Owen Connolly. I'm the editor at large at Sports Pro. Hope you're well. We are a couple of weeks here in this part of Europe into the Six Nations Championship, one of the highlights of the rugby union year, even if it is a slightly altered highlight for a slightly altered year in 2021. Uh, But it's taking place against a backdrop of investment chatter and lots of conversations about the future of the sport of rugby union, how it's going to be governed, how it's going to be paid for, and all the rest of it. So we're going to have a focus on that this time. And to take us through that, very happy to have with us the captain himself, sports industry veteran and newly minted sports pro columnist, Giles Morgan. Hi, Giles. Hey, Owen. And joining the podcast for the first time, Black Star Capital Portfolio Manager, James Paul. Hi, James. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Both of you have recently written pieces for sportspromedia.com examining some of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Um, So timely in every sense, I think, your participation in this podcast. But I mean, Giles, just first of all, you know, we've chosen the Six Nations Championship for its topicality, but it, it, it kind of brings up a lot of the themes around rugby, around what's appealing about it as a sport, around what's appealing about it for investors, around things that people want to protect, things that people want to change. Uh, I mean, first of all, obviously, you work sponsor side for a long time with a brand that is involved with rugby in in some contexts. What is it about the Six Nations Championship specifically that is uh, that, that's appealing as a property? Well, there's a lot. Um, if you are if you're from the rugby northern hemisphere um, countries where the Six Nations impacts, it's very much part of the the winter tradition for for those fans who are fans of rugby it's been going for a very very long time as obviously the five nations and then six nations from 2000 and like a lot of sports um, particularly in the early television um, era particularly British television um, there were certain events that became sort of cornerstones of the annual sporting calendar and there was the summer season of course with things like the derby and Wimbledon and the test matches England test matches but in the rather dreary very end of January, February and March, the light that lit a lot of people's rather cold homes was the, 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 the Six Nations, the Five Nations. Not just because it was the tradition of, of the home unions and then France and then Italy coming into the fore, but also a sense of camaraderie, of friendships, of a reason for people to meet, to go on tour every two years to one of the cities and became a tradition um, that over the years, um, like all traditions, grows and grows and what the marketing men can probably never replicate because it takes years to, to build a brand like the, the Six Nations Championship. I looked at it for a long time at HSBC. In fact, when HSBC was involved with the British Lions, as it was for two tours in 2009 and two th- 2013, and I think it was one of the most compelling demographic sponsorships that one could look at. In those days, I'm going back to about 2011-12, it was obviously terrestrial television, as it is um, basically now, and it was an extraordinary social uh, gathering um, across the weekends that, that it takes place. You don't get a lot of um, competition, as you do in the summer sports, where there's an awful lot going on. You know, Wimbledon can compete and rub against other sports, or Wimbledon can suffer if there's a World Cup final, or whatever it may be. Six Nations doesn't really bump against anything. You get your audience. So it, it's one of the, 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 the jewels in the crown, for, for sure, as part of the social fabric. And living in France, as I did for a couple of years, I realised it was just the same there as well, is that people would stop their weekends. They'd plan their weekends around Six Nations. So it's not so much the product of rugby. I mean, rugby is the ultimate end game, of course. It's everything else that comes at, back around it that creates something very special. And I mean, that's one of the things that makes it such an interesting challenge now for Six Nations Rugby, for the the member unions, for World Rugby as well, and in a, in a slightly different way. Um, when you look at the commercial potential for the sport and, and how you're going to grow it over the next couple of decades, because what you have, as well as being a traditional 
event, a traditional part of the calendar and something that's kind of tied up in the, let's be honest, the enmity of some of the countries involved in a, in a friendly way. You also have a de facto European Championship and that has a different set of demands because there's all kinds of arguments about merit and you know which teams have a place at that particular table and how you're going to be able to get other teams involved. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you wouldn't invent a lot of the traditional sports, you know, in ter- well, it's not sports formats. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Six Nations. Should there be relegation and should there be other countries coming in? And of course, from a sporting point of view and the growth of the game, that makes all sorts of sense. But if you're an investor, and I think CBC have already started to demonstrate the muscle flexing around the premiership, is that they don't want relegation. They want to know they want to stabilise volatility by not having um, a country, if it was the Six Nations, coming in that there is no tradition in the way that Italy provides a brilliant Roman weekend and therefore a great deal of appeal as part of the, as part of the, the tradition. So we're getting to a really interesting time in the, in the sports industry where you've got the tradition of sports, which has a huge commercial potential for all sorts of reasons, which we'll get into. But at the same time, the value is often in the tradition and the heritage. But the tradition and the heritage don't always make commercial the best of bedfellows. And therefore, you've got this very uneasy um, path to to try and uh, navigate, of which the Six Nations certainly does have to. It's been fascinating, hasn't it, that I think many of us have longed for the Six Nations to break lockdown and COVID kind of inertia. And there it's been on. And it's great. And I support Wales. So lucky me, they're, they're, they're two on the bounce. They're quite lucky, I, w- I would probably argue. And yet, there is something a bit missing with the crowd. And I had uh, on my own podcast, uh, The Captain's Table, I had Jamie Roberts, the former Welsh and British Lions centre on the show. And he said, playing rugby without a crowd is very different. There's something about a crowd as a player that makes you go into tackles, makes you go in for hits, makes you go in for trying that little bit harder that he hadn't experienced until the the crowd were taken away. But the Six Nations is so strong that despite the crowd not being there, it's still the Six Nations, and I think the viewing figures are pretty strong. I don't think they'd want that forever, but it will survive this, and it's not to the detriment of the Six Nations. I think it's been a reinforcement of actually how much it does matter. Yeah, let's let's just take a step back, James, because I want to bring you in. Step back from the Six Nations specifically now and think about what we've learned over the last year about the rugby union model. But I suppose the, these are not new conversations. A lot of this was happening uh, in 2018 and 19, some of these conversations around private investment in rugby. What What's appealing to private investors, first of all? What have they seen in the sport of rugby union? Which bits do they think we can grow this and, and we can make some money out of it? Yeah, it's an interesting question because obviously, you know, as we, we've touched on there, there are a whole bunch of different ways or properties that you can invest into in rugby, which have slightly different characteristics. But I think one thing that they all share to to greater or lesser extent is a sort of under-exploitation commercially versus where they could be. It's easy to forget, I think, that rugby obviously compared to to a lot of the other major sports, especially football, is really only very recently a professional game. And as a consequence, and I think it goes back to the sort of heritage point that Giles was making, there's been a lot of that and it's been a much slower transition towards, okay, this is a business now where people get paid money, look to make money and try and do this in all sorts of smart and, and innovative ways. I think both at the the union and the club level, there's been a sort of, oh, this is more about the sport, growing the game. We shouldn't be focusing on making money. We should be focusing on making the sport great, which is admirable, but can't last forever. And then I think you get something like a, a financial shock like we've had with the pandemic. Obviously, it's hit sport as hard, if not harder than the most industries. And people... You know, if you take a club, for example, that was losing a million a year, well, suddenly it's losing eight million a year during the pandemic. It's a completely different mindset that comes out of that. It's like, okay, now we need to focus on this more. And to an investor waiting in the wings, it's like music to your ears. It's like, yes, there's this property. It's got a great base. It's a, you know, 
incredibly exciting game. I think you can't say that about all the the major sports in the world. Rugby has, I think, a really good mix of you know exciting moments. It's ripe for exploitation and and growth just more broadly to the extent that it almost doesn't matter what part of it I buy into as long as I believe in the game itself. And then you can obviously have the the grander plans on top of that, such as such as presumably CBCs where if I buy into multiple things, I can bring them together. And then as I grow rugby, the sort of synergies between those will grow stronger and it all becomes more valuable. So I think, yeah, it's it's, it's a really exciting time for anyone looking to, to invest in the sport on, on pretty much any level, frankly. But if you were doing your, your SWOT analysis or, or what have you, if you were taking an overview of the sport generally, where, where are the strengths and where are the weaknesses for rugby right now? Take the pandemic out of the equation because that has a, pretty extraordinary chilling effect think you know let's just think about the sport in its own in its own context if we were having this conversation at the back end of 2019 where would you have said okay these are red flags these are things that are going to have to change and and these are things where you have that enormous opportunity that you've you've discussed there sure well i think the the there are two main weaknesses right as i as I see it the first one is that it, it's not even necessarily the, the, that the, the sport is trying to make money and can't figure out its model. There are plenty of examples where it has. It's more that a lot of the people in the sport don't need it to make money and have just not had that as an aim, which for an investor is kind of ideal because it means it's not that the model has failed, it's that no one's even really tried the model. So if I come in and just make this a commercial operation, there are undoubtedly a huge number of easy wins where I can create value. So that would be one key weakness. The other, and it's not so much a weakness, you can sort of see it two ways, I guess, but rugby is obviously big in the countries that play rugby. But outside of that, in the rest of the world, you know, incredibly small sport. You know, anecdotal example, but uh, I happened to, to find myself in New York. Um, I think it was the, the England-Australia World Cup quarterfinal. It was difficult to even find a bar that was showing the game. And, you know, this is one of the biggest countries in the world. And not just that, a country that absorbs sporting content like few others um, could, couldn't even find the game. And so I would say if you're looking at it more, more, more broadly, it's, OK, first off, sort out our weakness in our own backyard. Let's make this make money the way it should and fully exploit the value of our rights as far as we can. And then let's take it further. Let's bring this incredible game to countries that, either don't know or don't really care about it at the moment and explain to them what they're missing out on. That, that to me, would be the sort of opportunity in the weakness, as it were. Yeah, and Giles, how, how would that compare to some of the conversations you'd have had around rugby uh, when you were investing, if you like, as a, as a sponsor? Would you have been more concerned about the existing audience, I guess, than, than the potential audience? No, I think there are so three things, and, and, and James made some great points there. I think the biggest weakness that rugby faces right now is pretty existential, which is the concussion issue. Um, it's something that World Rugby have been really, really battling hard to get on top of, and I commend them for it because it's very difficult. Rugby is a collision sport, and collisions in the modern world where there are injuries, uh, particularly when you've got athletes as fit and as large as the current rugby playing model they it, <laughs> these are big collisions and the danger to the sport is pretty existential because if it's proven that this is a game that is going to be causing long-term concussion and, and neurological problems is that schools will stop playing and if you stop the pipeline the sport the sport withers and dies um, I suspect jousting had the same problem a few hundred years ago um, <laughs> as people's eyes were being taken out um, a flippant comment perhaps but I do worry about that but I also know speaking to World Rugby that that is something that they are unified on is to try and find the protocols but it is a threat yeah I think so I think that that's that's one thing I'm very excited about the current audience because the data and you would expect me to say this with my role with Pump Jack um, the data power of the demographic of the rugby union fan be it Six Nations, be it British Lions, be it World Cup, is a very, very powerful demographic for the right brands like banking, like insurance, like all of those sectors, because you're talking about a very healthy demographic with a very high net worth. And 
in the past, television data has been, as we know, the currency of value for the sports industry, which has been a kind of advertising equivalency, but not provided a business case. And with the right data, rugby becomes very, very attractive. And why I suspect getting the details, the, the knowledge, the behaviours, engagement with that fan base is the way to sell direct to consumer, the way that OTT starts to come into play, where you have a very real indexing of that fan base, which if you're looking for multiples and, and increasing the average revenue per user, to use telecoms um, jargon, if you know how much an England rugby union fan spends today, empirically through your own data, that they're spending £75, say, a year, and you know where they're spending their money in merchandise or ticketing every now and then, and you know what beer they drink, and you know all of the things that you need to know as a marketer, as an investor, with that, with that demographic, you can then upsell. And upselling, of course, is where they're worth £75 this year, and we've doubled that next year. And that direct consumer model is where that sport is going. Um, so I'm very bullish on rugby. The third thing I would say, and, and I have said this publicly before, with HSBC, one of the things in 2010 that I led was HSBC sponsoring for the first time the Sevens World Series, which was in a direct, all came about because of the Olympic inclusion, which was HSBC was part of the lobbying brigade. And Rugby Union was joining the Olympic family, the most powerful Olympic, well, the most powerful sporting family in the world, of which being part of the Olympic movement meant that one, there was going to be more funding for other countries that may hitherto not have touched rugby, but sensibly with the format in sevens, in seven aside, that was uh, required less players. Also a different physicality because Rugby Union tends to have quite a lot of extremes, which is part of its joy with 15 aside. But it's also very similar to touch rugby, tag rugby, playground rugby, and a very, very simple game to understand. You don't need the nuance like you do for 15. And I feel that um, rugby has been slow to use sevens more than the Sevens World Series, which HSBC still proudly sponsor and do a brilliant job of, because they haven't used it as their accelerant into these new markets and to really try and capture it. There's been until recently a sense of, well, the old guard, it's 15 aside, they'll all understand it, we'll grow that way. It's expensive and it hasn't worked, but it could work. And that needs to be part of the, the, the long-term plan, I believe, for, for rugby, um, which then you use sevens as perhaps the Trojan horse to start building the 15 aside game in as well. Yeah, I think there's a couple of really interesting points there. I think that the point about concussion is a, a very important one and sevens as well. I think we, those are ideas perhaps we can revisit when we, we talk a bit more about stakeholders in the game and, and you know the the practical role that investors maybe will have in a in, in a sporting context where you have you know rights holding federations and, and everybody else in that in that conversation. But let's let's break it down a bit more, James, on the financial side. What parts of rugby union specifically are on the table here? Because the conversations that we're hearing are different from those that might relate to, say, Serie A soccer in Italy or buying into NBA teams. Or what? What's on the table here? What? What are what are investors looking to get a piece of? Yeah, I think that's a really good point to make, and it the comparison really is that you have what I'd refer to as as more like mature brands like a, a Serie A or an or an NBA versus rugby, which is still very much growing. And, you know, you can you can take some examples of that just from the, the broadcast contract ideas that, that CVC are clearly bringing, right? CVC put it in the contract that of the investments they were making, there had to be upgrades to infrastructure at the clubs or, or, or teams where they deemed it appropriate so they could improve the broadcast experience and hence grow the broadcast contract. So I'd say in terms of most investors, it is more just about we can make the broadcast contracts here bigger. That's the biggest revenue earner in sport. All we have to do is invest and grow. Whereas in football, for example, you know, you don't need to go to, to AC Milan's ground necessarily and say, OK, I need you to invest in X and Y because they've been doing it for years and years. It's a, it's a different conversation. It's about much more marginal gains. That's one side of things. The second side of things, which I think is really interesting, which is uh, another point Giles, uh, Giles just made before, is this idea of increasing the average revenue per customer. 
as, as Giles alluded to, it's incredibly valuable to rugby that their base is affluent. You know, it means most of them are not going to be put off by a move to pay TV. It means that if they go to the stadium, you know, they're going to have a few drinks. They're going to have, you know, probably some food. They might buy some things while you were there. But you need to be set up to take advantage of that. You know, anecdotal again, but I was speaking to one of the clubs in the premiership who informed me that they're obviously taking this this all a lot more seriously now, but they informed me, you know, two to three years ago, they did not have a club shop at their stadium. If you wanted to, to go in and buy, you know, a replica shirt or something at this club, you couldn't do it on the day. You had to order it online and, and do it all separately. You know, that's a super easy win for an investor on the financial side to, to grow that average revenue per customer. Um, and it's interesting. There's a lot of talk, I think, around the sport that, the American investors are the ones who are especially focused on this. And I don't think that's a coincidence because they are by far globally the best at fully exploiting that average revenue per customer. You know, if I use some, some examples, right? So in, in, in football, I'm a, a Liverpool fan, which was fun up until recently. And uh, in America, I'm a, a fan of the, the New England Patriots. I can buy a few different Liverpool things. I've been to Anfield, it's, you know, a decent experience, etc. But when I compare it to what I can get as a Patriots fan, I, it's incredible the amount of merchandise that gets sold, you know, how easy it is to buy almost anything from them, whether I'm at the stadium, in America, overseas. It's all incredibly, you know, smoothly oiled machine, as it were. And that's why I think an investor will look at something like rugby and say, OK, I can introduce this, 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 this tomorrow. And I've got an affluent base who, you know, has an emotional attachment to a brand. That's incredibly powerful, I think. You know, I support England. I support my premiership club. I'm happy to spend money because it's A, something that, you know, symbolizes me as a, as a member of that tribe, as it were. But also, I know that money is going to that thing I support to help them, you know, remain valuable or remain important. You know, in speaking to, to both football clubs and rugby clubs during the pandemic, one of the things that's been amazing to me is the number of football clubs that have said, yes, obviously, you know, with regard to season tickets, there's been a lot of applications for, for rebates or credit or whatnot. Whereas on the rugby side of what I've been told is there are some of those, but, you know, an extraordinary number of people have been coming back saying things like keep the money. The club needs it more than me. I'm, you know, I'm happy to to roll it. What can we do to support our team? That's the kind of thing that's just incredibly valuable to an investor. That that sort of that loyalty combined with affluence, and so I think it's really important. And James is absolutely right. The, the sport, particularly um, on this side of the Atlantic, has been so slow to identify its knowledge of its own consumer, its own fan. That that fa- that fan loyalty that James refers to. We're more loyal to football clubs and to the sports we love as we are to music and brands we love. The things that make us human are the things that make us spend money, whether it be sport, music, entertainment, sex. It's all of the things that make us human beings, which make us make irrational decisions based out of things that we want, covet and love. And sport sits right in that pantheon and is untapped because the moment you trap and understand that consumer and exactly right, things like the merchandise outlet is not just so people can buy the scarf. It's so that you know about them and that you can then talk to them again and say, well, next time you come to Augusta National, don't just buy the buy the T-shirt or the polo shirt. Why don't you buy the deck chair, which, by the way, retails $150. That's more money for us, but also gives you the bigger experience. And we know where your zip code is. And therefore, we can build up something that to sponsors, to investors and back to media is actually the grist to the mill. And the sports industry, of which I'm apologetic about, because for ever since I started in 91, the sports industry has been based on creaking TV with media paying rights fees and then sponsors coughing up extra money. And the sports industry broadly going, any rights holder going, brilliant, we got our money, we got it from the media and we got it from the sponsors, let's sit back for four years and we can enjoy our gin and tonic and wear the, the blazer and the crest rather than saying, right, we've got a media model, which is important, that gives us a product, we've got sponsors, there's so much we can give to sponsors. And we're building this out into a 
a proper commercial ecosystem. And what we're living through now and why people like James are very much now involved in the sports industry is they are seeing the opportunity that lies within sport through that power of the fan base. And this is why this conversation is fascinating because rugby union, like golf, like tennis, like a number of other sports, has so much latent power that has not really been exploited. Hello, I'm Matt Rogan. I've spent my career creating and scaling businesses in sports and entertainment. And now I'm talking to smart leaders inside and outside sport to get their ideas on managing change and building towards a better future. You can listen in on the Playbook podcast, a collection of candid, agenda-free conversations full of practical advice your company can work with. Get your new episodes right here on the Sports Pro feed and check out the rest of the series wherever you get your podcasts. I suppose the conversation we're also having is about ownership of opportunity and about scale and both of those things being driven by a move away from the, the kind of monolithic delivery methods in media, the, the old TV model, as, as you put it, Giles, into something in digital media where people are kind of picking and choosing the things that they're interested in and, and kind of living with those things all around them much, much more. And the need within that to, you have to invest to achieve the scale required to be agile enough to deliver all those things that that you were talking about James so that's the opportunity from the rights holder side what do they need to be conscious of when they're having these conversations with investors how how are these things going to be productive because you have organizations that have worked in a certain way for a very long time that have been used to having control over certain aspects of their operation and I suppose, used to living in slightly less pressurized environments sometimes. I don't want to talk about that specifically in a rugby context. but And, and also, you know, we'll come on to the, the rights holder side later, but what do people who are involved in running sport need to be aware of about the conversations they're going to be having with investors? Yeah, I think it's a really good question, actually, because there are obviously ways in which certain things will be good for everyone, and that's great. But then there are definitely items where this is going to introduce a level of conflict, right? You know, for example, again, coming back to the CBC deals that we, we've all been watching over the last couple of years, you know, CBC have taken minority stakes in the equity itself, but within the contracts have taken control over the commercial decision making. Now, that is not an accident. That is CBC saying, we know that down the line, there is going to be disagreement here. And so we are going to take control because this is the part that we're focused on and that we want to do in our way. Just to give you an example, and I think this is this is obviously very topical because everyone's talking about it at the moment. Will the Six Nations go behind a paywall? I would say at some point, almost certainly, yes. It is undoubtedly going to prove, I think, to be a better way of making money for CBC. And they have control over the commercials for this reason. That being said, it's very much a trade-off in the mind of the administrators of the sport and the leagues, right? Because, okay, you're going to be making more money and that's more money for the union, more money for the clubs, more money to invest in the game, which is great, but you are undoubtedly going to make that audience smaller. And when your mandate is to grow the game, get it to as many people as possible, that's not something you're going to be necessarily immediately supportive of. So it's going to have to be a conversation whether that's in the complete long-term interest of the sport or not, as it were. Um, And so that to me would be a particularly good example of, okay, you know, are we going to let this go completely behind the paywall so that you have to pay to see any content at all Or how are we going to make sure that we still have some content available for free to air so that people can pick it up in that way? That, to me, would be an example of the main type of conflict between commercial and administrative uh, running of the sport. And this is going to be a really difficult challenge for rights holders, right? Because the bank has changed or the bank is in the process of changing of where the funding comes from. And if you're used to, as sports have been, of taking the check from traditional media companies and therefore the sponsors of which size has always mattered it's always the biggest number of eyeballs how big is it how many fans have we got it's always been about that number to try and get the advertising equivalency so that sponsors will bite too 
And what James is saying, and this is going to be faced across so many sports, is at some point you're going to have to unhitch your wagon and change the business model because eventually that known audience, that known audience particularly through a stream service and through OTT, um, which is direct-to-consumer, not only provides you with an audience, but it also provides you with the extraordinary potency of, of data intelligence about the consumer. Because if you stay on the old model, nobody knows in the Welsh Rugby Union that I was watching that game of rugby, uh, the last two games of rugby as a Welsh supporter living in London. They know nothing about my demographic. They know nothing about the value that for the, all my life that I do buy tickets when I can. I do um, consume Welsh rugby in the way that I do as a fan. I do take my family. I do drink certain wines. I do drink certain beers. I do like to go on certain holidays. I do like all of these things. You, you get my point. That knowledge base is a whole new funding model of which rugby sits right at the top of the, of the tree. But my God, you've got to be brave as a rights holder to say, right, we're ready to disimmediate and move into another model. So what you'll see is a gradual change. But if we'd been discussing 10, 15 years ago, the concept of how do you watch your movies or box sets, and we'd say, oh, well, you're going to completely disengage and there's this thing called Netflix coming along, we wouldn't have felt very confident. In the same way that 25 years ago, if you'd said, do you want to, uh, do you believe in blockbuster video is going to go bust? People said, never. It's absolutely on every corner. And that's how you get your films. And of course, it didn't. Things moved and things are moving in sport. What about the, the I mean, I suppose what I'm also talking about is the leverage discussion and any investor who feels that they're going to bring in a lot of capital up front and they're going to want to make certain demands, as you as you say, James, they're going to be initiating conflict. How ready do rights holders need to be for that conversation? And I guess, Giles, from your perspective, you have dealt, you know, you've been the person writing the check in the past. What has the attitude been in the old model where someone is, is perhaps, you know, you they're, they're patronizing an event for a short period of time for a, 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 a rights term. They're not taking ownership of anything outside of, of that period. How did you feel the balance was there and how would it be different when someone is actually taking an equity stake? Well, I think if COVID's done anything for the sports industry and it's been horrific around the world and a very sad time, obviously, what it has done is allowed the sports industry to take a good hard look at itself and perhaps to learn. It's very difficult when you're trying to run events and manage a business to stop and think when you've got the next match or the next event or tournament, or whatever it may be. And I think what you're seeing um, is a real, and the, certainly the conversations I've been having with, with Pump Jack, which is a, a tech product, it's, it's not normally the conversation you'd be having with people from the sports industry because they didn't have time. Now they have time because they're thinking about this fan value and lifetime fan value is the key to it all is how much money can we make over the course of someone's life um, as a fan of Aberdeen or whatever, wherever it may be. So A, I'm thinking and hoping that rights holders are really now rapidly in an advanced learning, which is great. I suspect that sponsorship decks are going to start to look very, very different over the next six to 12 to 18 months and goodness knows they need to i've seen most of them um when when back in the day um and they hadn't they didn't change very much it always started with do you know how many people watch us we think on telly they didn't put it that way but that was kind of the the sales pitch and i think now the sales pitch is do you want to know all about our fans because we know everything and you should too you'll be very interested in them i think also in the recruitment market you're seeing new people coming in with a very different skill sets and broader skill sets, particularly in digital and data, which is going to be absolutely essential. And that will be the area I suspect you'll see that the um, investment community will really be looking to make the hires to into the commercial systems of rights holders to ensure that they're fit for purpose for the new commercial model, which was the reason they invested in the first place. The running of the game, the colour of the strip. I would hate a private equity guy to start telling me what the Lions should or shouldn't be wearing. I remember at HSBC, all the investment bankers, they all thought they knew everything about everything. And, and I love them all dearly. But I remember there was a sort of, well, we're investment bankers. We know everything. Well, you know money. You don't know necessarily about 
you know, brand. You don't know necessarily about tradition and heritage because that's there are other skill sets there. What we're going to get, I hope, is this combination of really savvy investment people who know where how to make the money, coupled with the tradition and heritage of people who understand the nuance of the sport, where EQ and IQ come together. That will make that will be where you'll see the successes um, in sports investment. James, I suppose that's an, a neat way of turning the question on its head, which is what I was keen to do next, which is where do investors have to be conscious of of overstepping the mark? It's a, a space where we've seen this kind of investment before, but not extensively. And we might be about to see it extensively, not just in rugby, but but right across the board in the next five or 10 years. Yeah, I think I think Giles has nailed it, honestly. Um, you know, again, when you look at these deals, they were originally, as as I'm given to understand, approached about everything being just a majority purchase that, that CBC or Silver Lake or whoever it was would take that majority stake and o- effectively own or control proceedings. And I think quite rightly, you know, the, the, the key administrators within rugby have said, hold on, you guys are definitely good at making money and we're absolutely interested in having that conversation, but you don't understand rugby the same way we do. You don't understand the heritage of the game. We don't want you making decisions like, oh, this team should wear this strip or you should call yourselves this instead because you know we, we feel good about the handle we have on that, which I think was absolutely the right approach. So as far as I can tell, right now, certainly it seems to be going in exactly the right direction of, look, we've given you control, a controlling say over the exploitation of the commercial rights. You guys are good with money. You're good with commercials. You're good with finance. Go ahead, do that. And we will continue to do everything else on our end. And by all indications, that's how it's working. But I think it is incredibly important that it continues to work that way. That's at the league level. It's interesting as well, speaking to, to some of the clubs who have obviously been, been approached um, about potential investments Again, it's the same kind of conversations. You know, the investors are, are coming up and saying, hey, we want to buy, you know, however much percentage. And the, the club administrators will go back, oh, okay, well, what do you want in return for this? And a lot of the time it's just, no, no, we just want the economics. Keep control, keep running it the way you are. You know, we can give you advice and help with the, the commercial side of things. But, you know, we're not about to, to, to do, you know, like uh, uh, that, the, the story with the uh, whole city, the football team, where the new ownership came in and then immediately tried to change the name and it all sort of kicked off a, a war with the fans. You know, I think I've not heard of any conversations like that happening in rugby. I think most of the investors are, are hopefully smart enough to know what they don't know. And, and so far, I think indications are that they, they, they are, which is good. Yeah, with that being said, just to take it back to something that Giles said um, early on in the piece, which was about the existential threat to rugby, which is is player health. And then the the big opportunity, which is in sevens for expansion and for rapid expansion, which might not necessarily match up to the short term commercial opportunity, which is some of the efficiencies that they could find in, in the 15 a side game. Is that also something where... You, you make your investment, but then you again leave the the administrators to to get on with those with addressing those particular concerns. Yeah, concussions is a super interesting one because at the end of the day, it's very much running of the sport, but it will, as Giles put it, completely affect the financials if it's not addressed correctly. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are really only two ways to address something like this. You can either change the game to a point where you get what's considered an acceptable level of, of safety, or you get to a point where you say, okay, here are the risks. We understand them well, and it has to be well. This is the risk you take in playing the game, and you have to weigh that with you know against the upside of, of playing a game that you love, being a professional athlete, you know, hopefully making some money, getting you know some fame, glory, etc. Um, I don't really see any other way out of it, as it were. You know, I, I don't think it's going to be a case of flipping a magic switch and suddenly it's not a problem. It's going to be something that they have to deal with over a number of years. As an investor, I think the only thing you would really want to get involved or or necessarily object to is if you saw that no work was being done on this at all or, or nothing productive was coming out of it. You know, you're aware it's a risk to your investment. You have implicitly, therefore, in making that investment, trusted the people who need to address it to continue trying to address it. And so 
as long as those conversations are being had and people are continuing to try and come up with new ways of dealing with it, I think that's the best you can do. Because beyond that, it's not really a, a financial thing. It's more just a risk that if unchecked will create a financial problem. It's interesting as well, I think, that risk, um, risk management within sport is something that is an enormously, enormously important part of, uh, particularly with investors coming in and seeing a much more rigid approach approach to the whole risk register. Sport is, like every industry, it's absolutely beset by uh, risk threats, whether it be from security, whether it be from business, whether it be from corruption. And sport, my goodness, has had its fair share of corruption. And that won't go away. It doesn't. And therefore, the more that investors come into sport in order to see that they can make big commercial dollars and make the big returns that they require for their own shareholders, the more that they're going to demand more and more um, uh, a tighter management of governance, as you would see in other industries. And that can only be good for the sports industry, because when you think about how sports really came about, they came about particularly uh, in the modern era from a sort of Victorian public school um, start and um, evolved as as the amateur ethos, not just rugby, but nearly everything, accidentally to grow and to cope with what was retail, what was people's leisure time. And then organisations were formed, but often in sort of in pubs and sort of the first minutes were rolled up and then they became tradition. All great, but it's different now. And if you dance with the devil of mammon, oh, I don't know sure mammon was a devil, but you take my point, you you also then have to change a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, regulation around it. And so it's not good enough to say, well, it was always like that. Because if, it, if it's particularly, if it's going to be potentially harmful to the sport or the investment of the sport, it's not going to be allowed. So it's this tightrope I was talking about is that everybody, no one wants a private equity person to mess around with the British and Irish Lions, which is, if you like, the ultimate expression of rugby unity. And you wouldn't invent it if you started today. And yet it's not even a country. Obviously, it's Ireland under both countries. It's, it's anomalous beyond anomaly. And yet it works. So you don't want anybody tinkering with it. At the same time, does the British and Irish Lions board need the very best risk assessment people right now working on them to help them figure out what to do with the Lions tour in South Africa? Yes, they do, because they can't decide it in a committee meeting with nice panels, soft panelled oak panels and over a card table. It's just not possible. And I think the best example of that, as we've seen in sport, is of all of the events that I've ever worked with when I was a sponsor, probably the most impressively run was the All England Championship um, with Wimbledon. Obviously, a private members club that puts on arguably one of the greatest sports events annually every year. And they were savvy enough after SARS to take the right insurance policy, uh, which covered them for the first year of COVID that no one was expecting. That wasn't fluke. These are, uh, this is an organisation that is beautifully well run with a very experienced committee thinking through all of the challenges. And I think that's what we're going to see more and more with private investment coming is best in class across all of the different skill sets required, not just traditionally, well, who runs the game? Who does the hospitality? Who does the PR? Who does a bit of this, that and the other? And make sure that George is working behind the bar in the member's bar because he's always poured a good pint of Guinness. That, that can all continue, but you need other people as well. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, guys. And um, just to wrap up, what do we think is going to happen in this area over the next kind of year, 18 months or so? We've got, you know, various different parties involved. We've got Silver Lake interested in, in New Zealand rugby. We've got CVC obviously active in, in Europe with uh, Premiership Rugby and Six Nations. How does this play out in the, in the short and medium term? I mean, I think we will see more deals. You know, I think New Zealand will do a deal, whether it's Silver Lake, whether it's someone else, um, and we'll we'll see the result of that. I think we'll see, you know, the smaller deals at the club level start to get announced. You know, you've got the big deals first because CVC coming into the leagues saying things like, "Yes, we're going to grow the broadcast," is the sort of 
the bigger piece of it. But it's important to remember that there's a trickle down. You know, those those broadcast revenues are still going 70 whatever percent to the clubs. So if you believe in CBC's plan, you will go and invest in a club. That makes sense. I think the next 12 to 18 months will be pretty much restricted to to new deals being done, probably mostly smaller ones, and everyone trying to deal with the the, the come out of the pandemic. You know, I don't think it will be an immediate right you know, commercial rights, broadcast rights, we've got to do all this now, we've got to get it. No, I, I think they need to deal with the pandemic now. And so it'll be, okay, how do we get everyone back in our stadium? That's the main goal for the next 18 months. And then it's really more three, four years down the line when we'll start to see big changes of the commercial type that we've been talking about. You know, for, for example, you know, I, I think I, I wrote in my, my article for Sports Pro that I don't actually think there's going to be this big overhaul to the broadcast where the Six Nations might go behind a paywall for at least three or four years because it's going to take time to bring it together and now they have to deal with the outcome of the pandemic. So to me, in the short term, it's going to be those two things. Smaller you know, deal making to sort of prepare and everyone trying to make sure they come out of the pandemic in an acceptable and sustainable as, as much as they can way so that they can go and attack some of these commercial growth opportunities that we all expect them to. And I, I would not only agree with that, and I think the other thing that the sports industry needs to be very watchful of because of COVID, because I think this uh, flight to investment from private equity and others was going to come anyway because they saw the potential of the audience, is what COVID has done is um, created a great distress market because a lot of rights holders are going to be really feeling the squeeze because of the, the unfortunate things that have happened. And not all money is good money and not all investors are good investors and not all of them have the skill set. So just because someone comes in with a big checkbook does not guarantee success, quite the opposite. And the rights holders who may be very, very taken by the leer of Wonga and uh, big bunts coming in, they need to be very, very selective about the kind of deals they do, because if they get the wrong, if, they, if they're backed by the wrong horse, private equity doesn't have a, a very strong tradition of hanging in with the investments forever if they don't work. And if they don't work, it doesn't matter who's to blame, it's bust, it's done. And that will be something that everybody needs to be very mindful as well. I'm, this is why I think it's this curious tightrope um, that, tight that's been having to walk between sport, finance. I believe I'm so excited. I think there's a golden age of sport. I absolutely agree. It's not in two years. I think it's the next five to 10 um, as COVID recedes or however we live with COVID and what, the, what, the, what a, a new world looks like post-COVID. We don't know yet. Is there a latent opportunity in the sports industry? Yes, there are a few hurdles to get through first. Okay, lots to look out for. Guys, thank you very much for your time. Uh, very much enjoyed talking to you. Thanks, Giles Morgan. Thanks very much indeed. And James Paul. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for listening as well. We will speak to you again very soon. Bye-bye. The Sports Pro Podcast is published by Sports Pro Media. The producer is Ed Dixon. 